night I come before you, perhaps with a little extra burden on my heart. I come from a very large family on my father's side. At our last family reunion, there were 182 rites, all members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And in our family are a number of ministers. There's one less tonight. As my cousin-in-law, Pastor Richard Brown, only 37 years old, passed last evening of leukemia. This very month last year, I was preaching in my home church for the usual big Thanksgiving gathering. And Richard and his wife were there, and he stood and gave such a wonderful testimony of the goodness of God. Tall, athletic man the least likely candidate for disabling disease. Two months after last year's Thanksgiving family get-together, Richard was out playing basketball with some of the young men of his church and suddenly felt ill. They rushed him to the hospital, diagnosed one of the most severe and deadly forms of leukemia. Just three weeks ago, I stood in his church and preached for him a revival weekend. He was in the hospital. They had given him three weeks to live. And the Lord has ruled, and now Richard awaits the coming of his Savior. And so it's with a certain heaviness that we come. His young wife, son of 14, a daughter of 10, and a daughter of 5. But I say again, tonight what I said last night, God is just as good at the funeral as he is at the wedding. And though you don't know Pastor and Mrs. Brown, I would ask you to lift that family in your heart with prayer. The book of Revelation. The seventh chapter. <laughs> We've been having such a wonderful time here, staying in the home of Dr. And Mrs. Buller. They are just gracious hosts, getting around and visiting your fair city. I went to downtown Lodi the other day. You know I had an exhilarating experience. <laughs> and of course, my wife has a number of family in the area. Several of her uncles have retired in this area and we've spent the day visiting them and we've been hosted by several fine families, the Bushnells and Pastor Graham and others, and we're just just enjoying ourselves. Your pastor has been so gracious. Folk, you have made us feel so good, and we're very happy that we've come. Revelation, the seventh chapter. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, 
till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. My subject, save the children. Lord, please bless us now as we shall look into thy word and guide us through it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. John has been given now two straight sets of visions. The visions of the seven churches. These unfolding panoramas of prophetic utterance that describe the developing personality of the church. And then he has been given the vision of the seven seals which in panoramic form display the institutional development of the church. And in the midst of this unfolding, suddenly there is a break in the narrative. The coming of the Lord is painted in chapter 6 in the closing verses, and just at the end of verse 17, the question is raised, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who? shall be able to stand. John is nervous about the answer to that question. He's left hanging. The Lord is seen coming and the clouds unfold and the rocks hurl and the wicked cry for mercy. And then in the midst of this, the question is raised, who shall be able to stand? And just as that question is raised, suddenly the scene changes and he is shown almost like an astronaut who was suddenly sent out into outer space, the, the whole circle of the globe. And, and as he views it in the vision that he has, he sees around the globe four representative angels. And curling around them are rolling, billowing clouds that he understands to mean trouble and calamity and testing and trial. And it's explained to him that these angels are holding back certain forces. And while they do so, suddenly, a fifth angel is unleashed. And he goes forth and he has something in his hand that John immediately recognizes as a seal. And he's told it's the seal of the living God. And the angels are instructed, don't do anything else until these these angels have finished their work. And the servants of God are sealed in their forehead. Exciting, prophetic information. But as the story unfolds, and the announcement is made, it becomes clear that God has something special in mind. For the cry for these angels to hold, and the sending forth of the sealing angel, focuses on something very particular. My subject, save the children. For in verse 3 we read these words. And I would like to hear all of us read verse 3 together because it's the pivotal verse of this sermon. Revelation 7, verse 3. Let's read. Saying, hurt neither nor the till we have Notice the use of the preposition in. Why not on their foreheads? Why in? Now while you're thinking about that, go with me to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. And I'll begin with verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. 
And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Verse 16. Let's read that verse together, shall we? And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their forehead. There it is again. There appear to be two competing entities, both concerned about the property just behind your forehead. One is sealing, the other is marking, but both seem to value what's just behind the forehead. Well, any two-bit doctor can tell you what's there. Right behind the forehead are those two big toes of flesh called the cerebral cortex. And written across the toes of the cerebral cortex are little pathways called God convolutions, which record everything you've ever heard or seen or tasted or felt or experienced. It is riveted right there. It is the seat of reason. And decision making. Oh yes, to be specific, it is the composite of your character. For character is nothing but the sum total of every decision you have made right up until this moment. That's the best definition of character. It's just the sum total of all your decisions about life. One angel is sealing. Another power is marking, but both recognize that what you have stored here is important, and what you have here is important. Going back to Revelation 7, it is obvious that the sealing power comes from God, isn't it? I saw another angel, verse 2, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living who? So the sealing is God's work. God then is putting some value on what you have placed here. But then in Revelation 13, we must study a little bit further. For whoever is doing this marking in the forehead uh, seems to come from some beast power. Look at verse 11 again. And behold, another beast. Well, if it says another beast, there must be a first beast. And the first beast is identified in Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Verse 2. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave... Oh, the who? The who church? The dragon gave him his power. Well, who is this dragon? Revelation 12 and verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now we have it. Here is this territory. It belongs to Henry Wright. But there are two opposing forces after it. One is devil-inspired, and it marks what I put there. The other is God-inspired, and it seals what I put there. But both know that what I have here is eternally important. Now, some of you expect me to take my Bible and... Or use Revelation 13 and Daniel 7 and go on and prove to you exactly who the beast power is. All I need to know is that whoever the beast power is, and that's not the purpose of the sermon this evening, all I know is whoever it is, whoever the guy is, he comes from the devil. That's good enough for me tonight. Is that all right for you? So I don't want him putting anything in here. Can you say amen to that? But here is important. We used to sing a song in Sabbath, Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. 
And be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above, and on it goes. That song was teaching children that what goes in here, and what goes in here, and what comes in through here, and what sniffs in through here, makes its mark in there. Save the children. Now, I want you to think with me for a minute. The Bible talks about God sealing. And then it talks about some other power of some religious nature, that's evident from the scriptures, who's marking. How do religious powers put their stamp on people? The answer is very obvious. Education. Isn't that right? I mean, there is somebody awake here tonight, isn't there? How does the Seventh-day Adventist church put its mark on people? Its seal on people? Its stamp on people? Through education, isn't that so? Has it ever occurred to you that one of the prime ways that the church prepares people to receive the seal of God is through Christian education? Oh, bless his heart, this man is going to take a sermon during the week of prayer and preach on Christian education. Yes, he sure is. For I am concerned tonight as we talk about faith for these last days that the church may be forgetting that God's God-given method for us to stamp and ready our children to receive God's approval is that we put into their hearts and minds the tenets of the faith. Teach them. Moses instructed the early Hebrew parents as they come in, as they go out, what happened in the Adventist church to family worship? Oh, let me explain to you what that is. That's when mother and father and children come together and pray and read the Bible at home. They actually turn off the television set and do that. Yes, they do. Shocking, I know it is. They do it. My dad was faithful. He would come in from work and of course, when I was growing up, that was back in the days when the Mickey Mouse Club had just come on, you know. About, 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 about the best thing on TV for kids, Mickey Mouse Club. But Dad would come in just about the time that thing was coming on. M-I-C-K-Y, click. <laughs> Never heard M-O-U-S-E. <laughs> come on, boys. Let's open the Bible. Let's read. And like some of you do, I would try to sit there, you know, with my head all shot off and acting like I wasn't paying attention. But the Holy Spirit would make my father's voice so loud behind my forehead that the words of Scripture would go in there. And years later, when I was out there running around with gangs and thought I'd left that behind, those words put there by a praying, determined father would ring themselves around in my head. I could not escape what had been placed there. I'm concerned about three things. Increasingly, our pulpits are becoming inhabited by men who didn't grow up in this church. I know that sounds rough. Two, increasingly, Seventh-day Adventist mothers and fathers are choosing for some of the most ridiculous reasons I've ever heard not to put their children in our schools. It costs too much. So does hell. It's not convenient. Neither was the cross. A 
the Adventist schools, uh, the Christian schools don't have the quality of the uh, uh, non-Adventist schools. By whose measurement? I stand today and preach in a church where church schools now scuffle for survival. And yet the Bible tells me there's an angel on the loose. What is he doing? Henry, he's looking for little hearts and minds and grown hearts and minds who are filled with the word of God so that he might seal them for eternity. And he's only going to seal what's there. And there's another power after those same minds who get there first may be the one who claims eternal victory. Tonight's sermon is a doctrinal sermon, and Christian education is a doctrine of the church. And so there is this angel, sealing. And there is this power, marking. And God is concerned. There is a sociological theory that says that an organization that gets removed from its roots loses commitment to the faith and principles of that organization. The theory goes further. It says that every seven generations, an organization tends to lose contact with its roots. Every seven generations. Now, I found that very interesting as I did my research. You see, if you count the lifespan of the Seventh-day Adventist Church from 1844, then we're just ending our seventh generation. And if you count our lifespan from 1863, we're just beginning our seventh generation. And isn't it interesting that it's been in the past several years that there has been increasing problem with false doctrine, false teaching, false ideas, false concepts creeping into our pews. Save the children. Recognize, my brothers and sisters, that God has given us a great gift in the power to reason and think. And he has placed in that forehead the greatest power on earth, the power to decide for or against Jesus Christ. Some people are saying, well, I, I don't put my children in church school because some of the kids there are just as bad as the kids outside the church. If the kids in the church schools are as bad as the kids outside, where did those bad kids come from? Boy, it's quiet in this place. <laughs> you see, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest treasure that the church has is its young people. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Can't you say amen? And the angel of God is concerned about this. He is assigned to this. He is, he is focusing on this. His job is to find and to claim forevermore God's own little lambs. And he is concerned that he claim them before the seal of God is placed. Well, Ellen White makes it clear that that seal shall be placed just before the close of probation. Yeah. 
save the children. Go back to Revelation 7. <coughs> and I'm going to read verse 2 again. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. I am told, I'm not, a, I'm not a physician, but I like to read the physician's stuff. And I am told that down in the convolutions of the head, of the brain, of the cerebral cortex, there are little cells. These cells are kind of shaped like the palm of a hand, and they have little endings on them called dendrites. And as we learn to do things, I am told, these little dendrites develop little nodules called boutons. It's boutons. And that the more you do a thing, or a habit, or a thought, or a word, the fatter the boutons get. Maybe we could have named this sermon, How Fat Are Your Boutons? <laughs> that as they fatten up, I'm just a country boy, so I'm doing the best with this I can. But as they fatten up, then I'm told it becomes easier for a child who's to be a future adult to begin to do a thing over and over again. Ever hear somebody said, I lied without thinking. As they developed this habit, uh, the Bhutans fattened up on the habit and became, as it were, clogged and kinked together. And so it became easier and easier for this person to do something contrary to God's will to the point where it almost becomes like breathing. Are you listening to me? You see, ladies and gentlemen, God gives us our children. They're impressed by the tones of our voice. They're impressed by the look on our face. They're impressed by the things that they hear and see. And as they grow, they develop concepts and ideas. And it was God's plan that all of our homes be little churches on earth where prayer and Bible and, 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 and kind words are spoken. This is not ideal hodgepodge. This is God's plan, church. And then we would send those same little hearts and minds to the schools where the teachers, those precious, blessed teachers, self-sacrificing teachers, underpaid, underused, underappreciated, pour out themselves for our children. Thank God for the system. But what happened was this. Satan attacked the home first, got us busy with all various kinds of activities. Mothers didn't have time, fathers didn't have time, and then we usher those little ones off to the school, and then we expect low die Academy to do for them what we did not do at home. School's falling apart. What do you mean? My kid's over there doing all kinds of stuff. Of course he is. He's doing it at home, too. Of course he is. We don't have a reformed school system. The system of Adventist education and Christian education, ladies and gentlemen, is designed to affirm what should be going on at home. Let the church say amen. So that this angel circling the earth in the last days can find even young hearts and minds so dedicated to Jesus Christ that he can seal them for eternity. And I am just optimistic enough to believe that our schools, given the proper chance, can do that for us. A Bible text is a powerful thing. 
A Christian song is a powerful thing. Little hands folded together. Oh, I used to love to do it with my little boys. Even before they knew who God was, take those little chubby hands and press them together and, and say, let's pray. And little Hank would look at me, you know. Most kids think their parents are crazy anyhow. Give me that little look that little kids give, you know. And you press those little fat hands together and you say that prayer and his eyes are open. Da, 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 da. You didn't know about prayer. But then it's mine, huh? The boutons. Somebody's going to get them. So they might as well be fat on prayer. Come on and say amen. They're going to get fat on something. Might as well be prayer. And the little mind begins to develop. And finally, he understands the word Jesus. It understands the word church. It understands the word God. And one day he becomes an elder in the church and tells somebody about that God. And the Bible is alerting us. We must be doing our work. Why, Henry? Because an angel has been dispatched and he's after those minds. But while he's searching, Henry, there's also another power searching. And in case you haven't noticed it, Satan, also understanding the value of the human mind, also has a system of education. And the Bible says in Revelation 12 that he, Satan, knoweth that he hath but a short time. Satan was shrewd. He knew that we Seventh-day Adventists would stop going to shows. <laughs> so he invented HBO. And showtime. Huh? Boy, it's quiet in this place tonight, but that's all right. Every sermon I preach, I preach till it's over. They won't go there. I'll bring it in here. You see, my fathers and my mothers, we must be guardians of that property and guardians of those minds. And you see, the old the slogan that the, that the black colleges use, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, applies to everyone, red, yellow, black, or white. It's a terrible thing to waste an innocent mind on the trash that sometimes comes over those airways. Any time you spend... Any money you spend, any affair you have, any project you sponsor that helps to hold our young people to this church is worth every minute and dime spent. For they are the church's greatest heritage. Now, if the sociological theory is true, and after seven generations, a group begins to lose contact with its roots, then we should expect that this generation we're now rearing may be the most pivotal and critical generation in the church. What kind of Sabbath keepers will they be in the year 2000? What kind of tithe payers will they be 20 years from now? What kind of fathers and mothers will they be? Satan says, if I can get to them, I'm going to mark them with my rebellion against God. And so the angel of God shouts to us. Get them ready. Get them ready. Look at 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5, quickly. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5, kind of alerts us as to the kind of world in which this seething work is trying to take place. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unholy, unthankful, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Of such turn away. This is the atmosphere in which we're trying to rear the greatest treasure of the church, our young people. And so this sealing work is so important. Jesus anticipated it. That's why he said in Matthew, the 28th chapter, verses 18 and 19, teach them to observe how many things, church? All things, whatsoever I've commanded you. 
Now, I come from the old school. And I told you I'm old-timey. And I believe that parents have been placed in the world to rear children and not the opposite. I believe in saying, no, you can't, that's not right, and all those nuisance phrases to young people. I still believe that it is valid for mother and father and children to come to church together. And even, oh, my sons would just die if they heard me saying this, sit together in church. I got a big 18 year old now. You know, we walk in church, see your dad, see your mom, take it easy. But he knows that dad will be looking around to see if he's sitting in church. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I just don't think we can wait till just before the close of probation and back up on things like that. Those kinds of things are still important. What do you say? Still important. I believe that when children are still young, they must be taught to stay in church throughout the service. Now, in this modern technology, now we have babies' rooms. and they, Wonderful, wonderful. Baby room, upper room, lower room, keep them in church. Let the process gradually grow into them that God is sovereign in their lives. You see, it's the greatest gift you can leave them. Not all the riches in the world will replace you leaving them a good character. For that's the only thing they will take from this earth to the next. I don't believe that the main function of AY, Adventist youth, is to entertain our young people. It's to educate them into the things of the church. And so in this atmosphere in which this work is taking place, we must be careful. Now as those boutons get fatter, you thought I forgot about that. And habits become almost singular. Hear me now. We're almost finished. Character becomes almost fixed. But as the doctors and scientists studied further, they discovered... That in spite of fat boutons and habitual behavior, that the human brain has the capacity to emit a chemical, an enzyme. That's a great big long word, so the scientists for us country folk have shortened it down to G-A-B-A, -A, GABA. And they've discovered, hear me now, they discovered that even in the wake of the most habitual behavior, that if the human mind will exert its will, didn't Ellen G. White say in Steps to Christ, page 76, that we've not learned the right use of the will? They discovered that if the human mind will exert its will in resistance to habit, that this enzyme, GABA, is emitted and begins to create new pathways of thought and habit around the old fat bhutan. No wonder the folk can say, what I used to do, I don't do anymore. Where I used to go, I don't go anymore. What I used to eat tastes bad now. How? There's a power down inside of me. The old black folk couldn't explain it until they said, something within me. I cannot explain something within me that holdeth the rain. All that I know, there's something within and now tobacco doesn't turn me on. Liquor turns me off. Sex now is not appealing in that old, filthy, and dirty way. Not because habits weren't there, but because there's a greater power than my habit. The power of the saving blood of Jesus Christ. Save the children. Save the children. And so a mind cooked 
old ways, a mind blinded by the temptations of Satan, can like a Peter sinking in the lake cry, Lord, save me. That's how some of you got to these pews tonight. You were lost and hopeless and folks had given up on you. But here you sit tonight, hopeful and decent and trying and scuffling and determined. And how did it happen? God, even in the, even in the physical, chemical aspect of man, prepared ways of salvation. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Satan had me bound, but Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Churches are built on three things. Myths, methods, and missions. The same sociological theory says that after that seventh generation, a church does well to go back and look at its myths, its methods, and its mission. Now I've got some information for you. For the Christian church, we may alter our methods. We may adjust the way we do things. But ain't no messing with the myths. Those are the doctrines, the beliefs. They are given to the church. We are stewards of those. We didn't invent those. In fact, to keep all you Seventh-day Adventist Christians properly humble, there's only one doctrine that the Adventist church ever contributed to Christianity. And that's the sanctuary. Everything else we got, we got from somebody else. It's all his. And so these myths are there. And we dare not alter our mission. How can it change? This gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness to all the world. Then shall the end come. We can't change that. But who's going to do it? The children. The young man was sent to school by his old country father. Father had worked hard and saved and wanted his boy to go to one of the fine, fine schools. And so he went without, finally saved up enough money. Bought his boy the right kind of clothes and shoes and sent him off. Oh, he was happy. He was so happy. Well, the boy got to the school and got caught up. Forgot to write his dad. Didn't make contact with him. The old man kind of waited around and tried to be understanding. After all, he knew his son was away in school. And that's what he wanted him to be and he was having a good time, and he desired that, and he was learning great things. That's what he was paying for, but thought the boy at least could drop him a line. And so finally he decided, well, I'll visit him. I'll go see my son. So he dressed up in the best clothes he had, didn't have much, put on a tie and shirt, and got on the bus, and rode the long trip to this great school. When he got off the bus and began to walk around campus, he could, he could see he didn't really fit in. His clothes were not stylish and so forth. But he kept asking around until finally they told him where his son was. As he walked into this great fraternity house, his son was sitting there with some of his friends and saw his dad. And as he rose up and looked at his dad and realized how his dad looked and how he didn't quite fit in. He really didn't want his friends to know this was his father. And so he kind of rushed over to his dad. Dad, it's good, good to see you. I've been, been playing all right, yeah? I know, son. I know. I know you've been thinking about me. Yes, I have, Dad. Uh, listen, why don't you just 
go over here in the library and just have a seat. I'll be right with you. So say goodbye to my friend. Oh, all right, boy. Dad felt kind of funny, but he said, okay. Young man went to sit with his friends. And all of a sudden, from the library, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Son jumped up. He ran into the library doors. Dad? Yes, son. Uh, was that you? Yes, son. I was just, just sitting here reading the Bible. And the Lord was saying how much he loves me. You know the text we used to read, boy? And, and, and how, how, how much he cares for me. And I got so filled up, I just couldn't hold it in. And I found myself shouting, oh, 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 okay, Dad, look, look, just, we don't do that here. Please. Well, all right, son. And so he went on back. Went back to reading. Son went back out to his friends and began to laugh and talk. It wasn't hardly five minutes later, folk. There it came again. Praise God! Thank you, Jesus! The boy jumped up. His friends looked funny. Kind of motioned toward the library. It's all right, I'll, I'll take care of it. He ran in. Dad? Yes, son. And now there were tears flowing down the old man's face. He said, look, Dad, uh, uh, you got that Bible in your hand. Well, son, I was reading... That the Lord forgives me of all my sins. You remember those texts some we used to read? Well, yes, Dad, I do. And, 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 and the Bible was saying that he's full of mercy and, and graciousness. And, and boy, I just, I just couldn't hold that thing down inside. And I, uh, before I knew it, I was... I know, Dad. Look, look tell you what. L let me have your Bible, please. Okay. Here, take this geography book. All right, all right. All right, I'll read the geography book. Son went back out to his friend. They were laughing and talking, having such a great time. And all of a sudden from the library, here it come again. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God for his goodness. His friends began to laugh. They just fell out with the old man's, I'll take care of it. Into the library he went. The old man was sitting there with a geography book. And tears were just flowing down his face. And the boy said, What in the world? I took the Bible from you. Now what have you found? He said, Well, boy, when you took the Bible from me, I was reading Micah, the seventh chapter. And, and, and there the Bible was saying that the Lord will, will take your sins and, and cast them into the depths of the sea. Well, the boy said, well, so what? What does that do with the geography book? He said, I just read the geography book that they got places in the sea where they haven't found the bottom yet. And when I thought about it, I began to praise and thank the Lord. Save the children. Plant in their hearts and plant in their minds and plant in their characters things that God can seal and erase from their minds and fight against in their characters things that Satan would desire to forever mark and make his. And the power and decision is in the hands of this church. And some of you sitting in this audience tonight wear stars and wear marks because some that I've preached about was not done for you. Surely we want to do it for others. We cannot end this week of prayer without facing up to the great responsibility that is ours to bring Christ into our lives, into the lives of our children, knowing, knowing, that this sealing work that I have preached about this evening is going on even now. Let us bow our heads for prayer. I'm going to ask the organist to slip to the organ and begin to play that hymn that we sang the other night, All to Jesus. I surrender quietly, 
and reverently. Father, how thankful I am. How grateful I am. that I serve a God with a plan, a master plan. There is a battle going on for the hearts and minds of men. <clears throat> Some of us in this room have been buffeted. Some of us were not reared as Christians, let alone Seventh-day Adventists. The mercy of God had to enter our lives. The Gaba of His grace had to create new paths of obedience over lives of habit and ignorance. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you did not give up on us. And oh, what a boatload of sins you've had to dump into the depths of the sea. Oh, but the old man has given me hope tonight. He found out that there are parts of the sea where they haven't found the bottom. Oh, Lord, once you put away my sins, they're put away forever. I'm the only one who can dig them back up. I don't know what this congregation thought they would hear, Lord, when they heard the title, Save the Children. But we've heard a sermon tonight, Lord, that is much more than just for children. Now, Lord, you've commissioned me not just to preach, but to win. And for five successive nights, we have talked to this congregation. I still don't know them as well as I'd like, but I feel their warmth. And the reason why tonight, Lord, I wish I knew them better is because I'm getting ready to ask them to do something. And I'm going to need your help. First of all, Lord, in our seats, in our pews, we, we recommit ourselves to the concept of Christian education. We do it. Some of us, even as we heard this sermon, have been saying, I've got to do more. Well, then do more. Some have made up their minds to make sacrifices that they've been thinking about, then do it. Others who've been wavering about putting their children in the schools, I hope tonight are rethinking that. Help them, Lord. But they can take care of that in the pew. No, tonight, Lord. I want to talk to that person who's been sitting and listening knowing they need to give their heart and mind to you. Maybe a friend of this church, maybe you've been visiting, just never gone as far as joining and being baptized. That's what I said. That's what I said. Or maybe they're a person who once walked with this church and was strong, but along the way, Boutons of habit and disobedience and rebellion developed. And they found it easier to stay, out, stay at home on Sabbath than come, to spin tithe rather than return it. But somebody invited them out to the meetings and they've been coming and the old feelings of joy and conviction have returned. And they would like to make a new start with you. And so, my friend, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed and folks are praying, listen carefully to my appeal. If there is one in this audience tonight who would give their heart to Jesus Christ, who would return, 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 saith the Lord, unto him, all you need do is just get up from your seat and come right down front and make your decision.
I know it's a bold and open appeal. Will you do that now? Is there one who will come? Right now. God bless you, dear lady. God bless you. Let me just take your hand. God bless you. Please be seated. Is there another who will come? I'd like to make it easier for you, but I can't. This is between you and Jesus. Just rise from your seat. <laughs> the getting up will make you feel better. Everything after that is easy. Just get up and come down. And oh, what a sense of relief and joy. Is there another? Is there another? God bless you, my friend. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, thank the Lord. God bless you. Just be seated. God bless you, my friend. God bless you. Please be seated. Come on. Come on. Come on. You'll think about it. You'll pray about it. And you'll leave here tonight saying, if only. Don't do that to Jesus. He's aching for you. He wants you to come. And you need to come. Not for me. But for yourself. Is there another? Is there another? God bless you. God bless you. We see you. She stood up and she sat back down. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for that decision. Praise the Lord. What a mighty God we serve. God bless you, dear. Please be seated. Just come. Don't make it a big deal, friend. You and Satan warring now, it's taking more energy to stay in your seat than it would to get up. God wants to help you. Won't you come? Is there another? Oh, I love it. I love it. Is there another? The whole congregation is praying for you, lifting you up. Just come. Is there another? God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my friend. Such joy. Thank the Lord. Please be seated. Such meaningful decisions. Oh, this excites me. I, I tell you, this excites me. This is what God is all about. Is there another? I wouldn't want to close anyone out tonight. God impressed me to do this. I had to do it. No choice. His choice. Is there just another? What a shame to say if he had just appealed for one more minute, I would have come. Oh, friend, come. Come. He's been waiting for you for almost 6,000 years. Don't torture him now. Give him the joy he's always desired. Oh, God bless you, dear sister. God bless you. Another one coming for Jesus Christ. Can't you say amen, folk? Amen. This is what church is about. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Please be seated right here on this pew. Here comes another. God bless you, my friend. Isn't God good? God bless you. Oh, thank the Lord. I'm so happy. God bless you. Please. We can say the closing prayer, but oh, my heart aches. Even while I'm praying, you can come. This is an eternal moment. The individuals who've walked down here have said, Lord, when you place the seal of eternity, I want to be in that number. All of us want to be in that number, isn't that so? And now we're strengthened by those who've come to join with us. I'm going to pray now, but even while I'm praying, you can come. Father, you've been so good. You take <laughs> oh, fellows like myself, such pitiful equipment. And you use us to say something in your behalf. It's a, it's, it's a miracle, Lord. It's absolutely a miracle. Even we ministers don't understand it. That's why Paul called it foolishness. Preaching is foolishness. And yet you've chosen this method, sinner talking to sinner, to somehow draw us. And so tonight, these precious ones have come. And Lord, we're so happy, so thankful. The angels of God have have struck up songs of praise. Uh, they would do this over one soul that repenteth. 
And we, the audience, have had a chance to witness this. It's made our faith stronger. Some of us deep in you have, have walked down the aisle in our minds. We've recommitted ourselves afresh. We feel like those on the front pew. Thank you, Lord. May I never get so holy, so righteous, that I, that I don't feel the need to come afresh. And so we've done that in the pew. But for those who needed to make a more visible commitment, we thank you for them. And now already we're making up our minds to lock their faces in our hearts and to put our arms around them and to let them know tonight how happy we are for their decision. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Now unto him that's able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the throne of his mercy and majesty. To him be glory and honor henceforth now and forevermore. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel to reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll free. 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.